Welcome to Oshkosh Outlook 2018. This is the sixth Oshkosh Outlook that Citizens for a Strong Oshkosh has put on. Our first one was for uh, the year 2012. And uh, Citizens for Strong Oshkosh is an inclusive, nonpartisan, community-based organization that promotes civil dialogue and creates settings for citizens to identify, review, and discuss current needs, emerging priorities, and opportunities for improvement. Citizens for a Strong Oshkosh believes that a key to community growth and for preserving and enhancing quality of life is an active, informed, and involved local citizenry. So we have um, five leaders of local institutions to hear from. Each of them has been asked to provide one slide and can speak to seven for seven minutes, up to seven minutes, or we might give you an eighth minute if you're nice. Um, and then um, following each present, uh, following all the presentations rather, we'll have some time for questions. So we'll be coming through and asking you to write them down, uh, insisting that you write them legibly, uh, and then they'll be brought up here and, um, and uh, they'll be answered by our panelists. Um, so first we're gonna start with Mark Roloff. He is our city manager. Thank you, Tom. We, we, I better get started on my seven minutes because Kathy is really strict on this. Uh, the first thing I have on, on the slide there for you is our budget. And, you know, normally that's a fairly dull thing, but I think the, the things I put up there I think are really important. Um, the 2.3% uh, expenditure increase is something that we're governed by the state in terms of expenditure restraint. And that's certainly something that we need to follow in order for us to qualify for state aids for expenditure restraint. Uh, but the other one that's up there is the 4.2% levy increase. And the question I often get asked is, why is the tax increase greater than the expenditure increase? And I think this, uh, I, I share this with all of my uh, local government colleagues, uh, state aid continues to be frozen or very minor increases uh, in, in, in state aid. And as a result, we have to rely back on local property taxes to fund basic services for local government. This is almost unprecedented anywhere else in the country. There's a very few number of states that have a higher reliance, but very, very few. There was an article uh, that I read today regarding Milwaukee with, uh, with their public policy forum in Milwaukee, a group similar to Citizens for Strong Oshkosh, where they take a look at issues that are facing Milwaukee and the same issue, and it's the same issue throughout the state. Uh, the over-reliance on property taxes, and even though we talk about how uh, bad it is for our property taxes to be so high, I can't agree more, but the reliance of other forms of revenue just don't exist in Wisconsin. Um, they analyzed a bunch of cities similar to Milwaukee size, and uh, sales tax is something that other states rely on, and we just don't. It's not that I'm suggesting that we have a sales tax, but if we're going to have a discussion about over-reliance on property taxes, the answer has to be, well, what other revenue sources do you look at? Uh, public safety staffing was uh, a major concern for council. Um, you're going to hear some things in the next couple of weeks about uh, the success of our uh, narcotic and vice task force in the police department with some great results. Uh, but the reality is, is that was not done with increased staffing from, uh, th that the council uh, gave the police department. It was based on the fact that we reallocated people from the street into this vice and narc unit. The problem with that is, is now we're taking people off the street for basic proactive law enforcement services. And the council recognizes that and wants to take uh, some action to make sure that we don't fall behind on proactive law enforcement because that's really where we make the impacts. Uh, ambulance revenue, we've talked about this before. Um, the, the reduction in ambulance revenue has nothing to do with volumes of calls whatsoever. In fact, our volume continues to increase. 
the issue is that uh, there's a very nice, polite term that's used, uh, and that's private pay. That doesn't mean that we have independently wealthy people paying for their own ambulance service. We have a growing number of people who don't have insurance. And the likelihood of us getting any money from those individuals is very slim. Similarly, the, another great portion of our ambulance revenue comes from people who are on Medicare, Medicaid, and the, the federal government does not increase those, uh, those reimbursements for those. We could double or triple our ambulance rates and we would virtually have no change in our revenue because that, those revenues are capped. And that number, uh, the council basically said we needed to, to deal with reality and we reduced our revenues by 500,000. And we just barely made budget with that reduction in expe expected revenue. So that's gonna be something that's gonna continue as our population ages becomes more reliant either on private pay, which means uninsured, or uh, somebody with uh, Medicare or Medicaid. Oshkosh Corp development, um, what would 2017 have been for me without Oshkosh Corporation? I don't know. Thank you. Thank you for that laughter. Um, the development on Lakeshore Golf Course was obviously a controversial issue, but now that the decision's been made, we have a lot of work to do to get, uh, get that going. Uh, they have a goal of uh, wanting to uh, break ground in the spring. There's a lot of things actually on the council's next agenda uh, to begin the process. One of it is higher level, uh, zoning in that area, not just for Oshkosh Corporation, which is their expectation uh, and desire, uh, but it's also for the rest of the area surrounding that. How do we raise the bar uh, so that that gateway, which is what we were selling to the public in, in large part, is we're gonna make this a gateway for us to be proud of. Raising the bar is gonna be part of that. Um, then also the, the corollary with that is what do you do with the balance of Lakeshore Municipal Golf Course? And we're gonna be unveiling some new uh, citizen engagement tools, some survey tools to get the public more involved in that. Uh, we really want to know what that's going to be. There are some people who think it should uh, get converted to a nine hole golf course and that's one option that's out there. But there are a lot of different things in the conceptual plan that we can also take a look at. And I'm sure that that's going to gain a lot of interest in public debate and that's what we love to have in Oshkosh is good civil, right down? Right. Civil so, public yeah, debate. Civil. Very good. Um, Couple capital projects for next year that we want to talk about. Um, Tom Blaze will be happy to hear. We're doing Washington Avenue. We wanted to wait until after the Y was done. Um, and Court Avenue also has to get done with that because we need to get the, 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 the storm sewer goes down Court Avenue. So you're gonna see a lot of that take place next year and we'll be very happy to have Washington Avenue done. For those of you who live on the, the near east side, I know that you have a lot of jolt when you drive down Washington Avenue. Oregon Street is all about getting sewer extended to the south end of town. Uh, that's where some of our growth area is going to be, uh, both uh, residential as well as industrial. And over the next five years, you're gonna see phases of Oregon Street continuing to uh, get new sewer put in and of course, new streets. And when you, uh, that's a big sewer down there, so we're gonna be digging pretty deep. Um, and then, of course, anything related to Oshkosh Corporation, we're doing some studies right now and we're gonna figure out exactly what we need to do out there to accommodate uh, traffic that we obviously will see as a result of that. And then long-term, what we wanna see along Oshkosh Avenue, uh, the council is being presented with not one, but two TIF districts. Uh, it's not that we're making it bigger, we're splitting it in two, it's just gonna make more sense to do it that way. And the one TIF will be just for Oshkosh Corp, just for those improvements right there on that site. And the rest is gonna be for the balance of Oshkosh Avenue. And one of the ones I think you're hoping to see down the road is uh, the redo of the Sawyer and Oshkosh Ave um, intersection. Don't all applause at the same time. I can't, there's, if, that, if there's one issue that everybody universally says is that intersection stinks and it's about time that we get it done. And here's an opportunity for us to do that. Um, uh, Sawdust District, the arena's going gangbusters, great attendance, um, more events need to go there. And then what do we do with the balance of that? Now that the arena's done, uh, the Pioneer, crossing our fingers, but that's gotta be the right time and everything. Um, with that said, 
Um, council is going to be approving what's going to be called the Premier Economic Development District. That's a nice, polite way of saying get the state to give us two extra liquor licenses so we can have an entertainment district down there. Um, and then lastly, uh, come this summer, council will be meeting to discuss a new strategic plan for 2019-2020. Um, we're going to be using some of those survey tools that I mentioned earlier to get more public input. The greater public input we get, I think the council really does produce a much more uh, inclusive plan that gets everybody's perspective on that. So those are the things that we're looking forward to next year. Kathy has put the stop sign up, so I am finished for now. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I'm confident you'll have some questions during the question and answer time. Oh, no. No, there, I'm, no I'm confident you will. Um, next, we're going to hear from uh, Melissa Cohn. She is the campus administrator right here at Fox Valley Technical College. Thank you, and good evening. Can you hear? Well, uh, OK. Um, I'm going to start with some district-wide news. First of all, I just wanted to share with you that our Board of Trustees has approved a plan to construct a new regional center in Watoma. Um, we are going to do that in collaboration with the Watoma High School, or Watoma School District. We will be co-located on their site. They have donated the land, and our um, foundation will be uh, building the building. It's a 12,000 square foot building to serve that portion of our district. And we will co-locate both with the Department of Workforce Development and the administration of the uh, Watoma School District. So that's, that's our big district-wide news. Um, I'm going to share a little bit with you tonight about enrollments. This is pretty much the same story I shared with you last year. Um, we are still in the midst of declining enrollments. Um, we anticipate another 4% decline district-wide at the end of this year. And as I mentioned last year, it's the perfect storm. It's the perfect storm of demographics, our population getting older, and a spectacular empl employment rate and a small unemployment rate. What happens when those two combine is there's a limited amount of folks that want to spend their time going to school. Um, however, I do want to share with you that we do have some good things happening. Um, especially in the Oshkosh area, we have multiple facilities here, um, and we're kind of holding our own in specialty programs at all those facilities. And the, and the good thing about that is these are programs that serve our industry locally. At Spanbauer, our aviation program is doing well. Um, wood techniques and construction. Uh, gangbusters, obviously, for construction because we need that everywhere. At the AMTC, our Advanced Manufacturing Technology Center, where we have uh, metal fabrication and welding, we're doing well. And a, a great deal of that is due to the uh, developments and the advanced uh, work of Oshkosh Corp. They have been working with us exclusively to do some training, so that's been really well. Um, at Riverside here, we're doing well. Um, in our health, nursing, nursing assistant, and our IT, our information technology has picked up, which is, which is good for us. That's, that's a demand area. Um, we found some interesting trends with our enrollments, and I uh, wanted to share those with you. On the very positive side, three different things. Our high school dual enrollment have increased 219% over the last three years. And I think all of these are indicative of trends in the community and, I shouldn't even say community, state and nationally. I think folks, families are understanding the cost of post-secondary education and um, they're looking for their children to grab some of those credits while in high school. So that's a real positive. Um, another thing is our online course takers. Um, three years ago, we probably had about 3% of our local population taking classes online. This last year, it was 20%. Again, an indication of a good economy. Uh, people are working. They want it to upgrade their skills. They know how important that is, but they need to be able to do that when they can do it. So that, of course, uh, is, works with online courses. And our other big... Um, Another big positive is our business and industry services. We had another uh, record-breaking year of revenues, $11.1 million 
in uh, revenues for our business industry. That's providing our uh, customized training. I spoke a little bit earlier about Oshkosh Corp. They do a, a, a great job and do uh, work with us a lot in providing welding courses out at the AMTC. So we're doing gangbusters. We're, we're, we understand that employers are employing whom they can get, but we employers need, are, are putting the bucks back into uh, upgrading those skilled workers. Um, the Promise Program. Last year I shared a little bit about the Promise Program. It is a scholarship program for graduating high school seniors within the district. There's multiple facets to it, but it's basically for low-income seniors, full freight um, for a technical diploma or an associate degree up to $15,000 if they're eligible. Um, a little background on that, this last year since introduced, we had about 800 uh, folks that showed some kind of interest. 147, 147 made it to the door in fall. So we had quite a bit of fallout there. Um, some of the things we, we wanted to look back at, lessons learned, what, what happened between that 18 and that 147. And the most important thing we learned is it's very difficult uh, to get personal financial information from individuals. Part of that process is they have to fill out uh, FAFSA, the federal financial aid. It's very difficult to, for, to get people to disclose that information. That was our biggest lesson learned. With that lesson, we have hired through some grant monies a full-time individual that will be working with uh, students, parents, families to fill out those financial aid forms exclusively. Um, so that's, we're hoping that will help uh, decrease some of the barriers. Um, 17, by the way, 17 of those 147 from Oshkosh. So we have some promised scholars. Um, we are introducing two new programs out of that promised scholar. We are starting this semester, uh, spring semester, we're starting adult promise. It is for a, uh, GED or HSED completers from 2014 on. And it will be the same full freight for a uh, technical diploma or an associate degree. Tuition, books, and fees. So we, it's an expansion and we're hoping that we can get more students in. And another piece is our adult start. Typically with the foundation, we have many, many scholarships that we provide, but we typically do not provide funding with those scholarships the first semester. And the reason why is the biggest fallout of students is in first semester. So we want our dollars, the biggest bang for our buck. So p students in first semester, in school, taking classes can apply for scholarships for the remainder. Well, what we discovered is there are people that don't have the dollars, even though financial aid may be eligible, don't have the dollars for, those, for that first semester. So we have a new uh, program called Adult Start, which is going to um, assist individuals with that first semester of um, funding. Um, that is about it, and I... Uh, do want to take this opportunity to publicly thank um, Stan Mack, who has been a great supporter of the Technical College. This is probably Stan's last hurrah, and I say probably because you never know, right Stan? <laughs> <laughs> but Stan's been a great advocate for the Technical College, and I've really enjoyed working with you, Stan. And I'm leaving a minute for you, too. <laughs> thank you. Isn't it wonderful to see different um, parts of government cooperating and working together? Um, and Stan, of our panelists, I expect you're the one who can most use the extra minute. So um, Stan Mack is our, um, the superintendent of the Oshkosh Area School District. Thank you and good evening. Uh, it was a pleasure to sit down. This um, was my um, rookie experience back in the fall of 2012 for this event and I look around the room and I think between one half and two thirds of you have been either here every year 
or um, in the audience, um, uh, in, the, in spite of whether it's snow or cold weather, you've been here six consistent years. And uh, uh, the joke has been that um, uh, one of my former principals always uh, reminded me of, not, uh, not a principal here in Oshkosh, but uh, back in uh, Minnesota, uh, who said, Stan, you never speak in sentences, you always speak in paragraphs. And uh, that, um, that's why my colleagues here always uh, <laughs> are of that opinion. The reality is, and I thank Melissa for her comments, but the, the reality is that every one of these partners here, your local government knows how to work together. And it's because of the respect that we have from each other, but know that those we serve are all of you, and we need to not go in circles, we need to hold hands. And uh, that is true of every relationship here, and I'm most appreciative. Uh, I can tell you it's a lot working, easier working with this group of uh, uh, six um, than it is in a district in suburban Minneapolis when you have um, uh, seven mayors, seven, seven, city, seven city managers, uh, seven um, police, chief of police, and seven fire departments to work with all in one school district. Uh, life is far simpler here in, in that way. I'm really privileged to share with you some information tonight regarding a, a number of issues within the district. Um, we're in, a se uh, in the second of um, two now consecutive strategic plans, uh, as we would re refer to strategic plan two, um, beginning in the fall, December of 16, and will continue through 2019. Uh, and our first one beginning in um, in 2012 and um, and going through uh, 2015 and uh, into 16 and uh, the, the initiation of a strategic planning process for the district is um, thanks um, to uh, the work of the Oshkosh Area Community Foundation support as well as the evolving at that time, not in 2012, but later formed Oshkosh for Education. Just a commercial, if you want to have details on the district, next week on the 11th, um, uh, we have um, a presentation at the Waters uh, on a our annual report for Oshkosh for Education. The strategic plan uh, is composed of an, a number of components, including, uh, first of all, improvement student lear for learning uh, for all students, um, the improvement of district communication, developing and investing in quality staff, maintaining and improving facilities, and lastly, strengthening the partnerships. Um, at this midpoint through this uh, strategic plan, we would be between the 50 and 60% of accomplishment uh, across the board and all of that, and that makes sense for uh, a three to four year plan, and we should be at about the 50 to 60% mark on accomplishing that, and those uh, details of that uh, strategic plan are available on the district website. Uh, you can uh, look up and see the gory details with a seven minute time limit. I can't go into the detail, I'd love to. The um, uh, school district, as annually um, we report, is so reliant on state um, legislative action. This past um, uh, legislative session was um, was uh, a good uh, good outcomes, but it could have been better. Um, the uh, the um, legislature uh, recognized across the state the number of operating referendums that were occurring in school districts throughout the state of Wisconsin, and they responded by uh, coming back with um, an addition of some $200 per pupil, which in our case amounts to about $2 million of additional revenue in, um, in the first year and now this and through the second year next year of the biennium uh, 205 or so, uh, so a little over $2 million. That um, does not um, deal with the issue truly of inflation because the way the legislature passed it and was supported by the governor was it gave every school district that say the uh, the same amount of new dollars per student uh, that doesn't help us with which has been our cause of having effectively uh, frozen referendums since uh, 19 um, uh, since 1991 92 93 and being locked in and not getting inflationary increases the legislature further had built into the plan was a plan to have effectively um, allowing districts three to four years to catch up that were below the state average because all we're asking for is to get to the state average. And uh, that uh, funding would have granted um, an additional um, 
um, four and a half million or four point three four million dollars, almost five million dollars um, is what it t would take to catch us up to the state average. In the end, the governor vetoed it. That portion that would allow us catch up opportunities um, and would have put us in a position that in the future our community would only have to be asking for renewal of referendums as opposed to potentially new referendums in the future. We will continue to work with the legislature, and, um, and I must say that our, our local legislators all supported um, that effort. Uh, but uh, in the end, the governor worried about um, what was going to be the impact on property taxes um, as a result because those new authorities would have shared revenue between state and local authorities. The irony of all of that is is in, this, in the fact that um, the legislature, um, starting with 2015-16, um, has uh, allowed um, uh, the levying for vouchers and the amount of increase that our local levy would have gone up to bring us to equalization is the same, uh, now about the same number that we would have, we are paying for vouchers. Um, right now, we are on our property taxes in Oshkosh, um, uh, we're paying uh, $886,000, almost a million dollars for non-public school vouchers that effectively is sending money um, through the county, uh, through the collections of the county, uh, through the state, and then paid back in voucher dollars uh, to pay for students who are already enrolled in, in non-public schools in the community. We are not losing enrollment. Three years ago, when, voucher, when the voucher program came into effect, I worried about our declining enrollment. No, we have not had declining enrollment. In fact, our enrollment is larger than three years ago. We continue to grow. We have roughly 1,000 students, uh, 10,000 students this year, and, um, and that uh, growth continues um, uh, across in spite of um, providing um, additional uh, voucher dollars for non-public schools. So that is, is, um, is a increasingly an issue that we face um, uh, and taxpayers will face into the future as we have uh, uh, that growth. The other good news that I'd like to share with you is open enrollment. Um, some uh, six years ago when I came to the district um, in the 19, in the 12, 13 school year, uh, we had some 132 uh, net loss of 132 students uh, that um, uh, were uh, lost to uh, out of district attendance. This is not included non-public, it's just simply other public schools or, um, or online schools. We now have cut that in more than half and we have less than 64 uh, or 64 students and by next spring it will be a smaller number than that uh, net loss um, of students. You mean the time is up already? <laughs> I didn't even see the one minute. Uh, uh. <laughs> I've, I've got, um, uh, when everyone else is done, I've got plenty of information for you. So, <laughs> so but I appreciate the opportunity uh, to um, uh, share with you the information and um, I'll be ready for lots of questions afterwards about any of the other topics. Thank you. Thank you, Stan. Um, there will be questions, I'm sure. Um, and next, we're going to hear from our chancellor from UW Oshkosh. That's uh, Andrew Levitt. Thank you. It's an honor to be here tonight. Um, great story to tell. UW Oshkosh is doing UW Oshkosh is doing very well uh, in the terms of our student success, uh, the number of students who are graduating. Uh, and, and, and also, the, quite frankly, the diversity of uh, the campus is, is, has increased uh, quite a bit. So I want to give you a few numbers, uh, and then we'll get into some of the other things here. Uh, at the December commencement, we, we graduated 1,100 people. Uh, that's uh, between baccalaureate, masters, and doctorates. We graduated our first class of, of educational doctorates, uh, so we're very, very pleased by that. Uh, we, that's our um, second full doctorate program that the institution offers. Uh, so that's, uh, we're doing very, very well in that. Uh, in terms of, um, of diversity, uh, right now uh, we're at the highest level of students of color in the history of the campus. Uh, about 14% of the students of the campus are now students of color in terms of the population. 
and that's gone up dramatically. <laughs> Thank you. When I arrived uh, three years ago, it was about 11%, so we've added three percentage points, and there's a lot of reasons for that. But uh, the interesting, the really interesting part about it is has to do with student success, is that there's something called um, the uh, achievement gap, and has to do with uh, how students of color perform, perform against their, their white counterparts. And we've always had a, a student achievement gap at the institution of anywhere from 10 to 12 points. I'm happy to report uh, tonight that we still have a student achievement gap, our students of color are performing at a higher level than our white students, which is the first time in the history of the institution. And that's attributable to a lot of great things that are happening on our campus uh, in terms of our, uh, our, the Center for Academic Support and Inclusive Excellence, uh, the, I, I think our faculty and staff, um, our, um, what I'd like to believe is our improving environment, but I really think we should ask the students of color of that. But uh, a lot of great things are happening uh, as a result of that. So I'm very, very pleased to report uh, that we're really turning the corner on that. And each successive year, I think you're going to see another percentage point or two in terms of the number of people of color on campus. We still have a long ways to go. Uh, the real Achilles heel at our, on our campus and, and on that subject has to do with our faculty, uh, that we're not diverse. Uh, the, the level of diversity in faculty is very low um, compared to the rest of the workforce. And so this is something that we have to work on very very, uh, very hard. Uh, what I would say here also is that um, our CAP program, as our Cooperative Academic Partnership Program, remains very strong in its 43rd year. Uh, 43rd year in terms of dual enrollment. This is where uh, we work with local high schools. Actually, they're no longer local. They're all the way to Middleton. Uh, they're all over the state now. We even have some in the West, and we're actually even breaking into Illinois. Uh, that we cross the state line now, we'll be offering CAP courses in Illinois. Uh, what CAP courses are, of course, is we have uh, properly credentialed high school teachers who uh, teach the college curriculum uh, with su that's supervised by UW Oshkosh, uh, and that allows students to take, currently take uh, uh, credit hours at UW Oshkosh, or through UW Oshkosh, at about $90 a credit hour, where typically it's about $450 a credit hour uh, as, as a freshman. And so uh, it's really uh, ignited uh, a, a new way of thinking here, and this is something the governor is very supportive of, the idea of the one plus three, the idea of trying to complete the first year of college while you're still in high school when you're paying $90 a credit hour as opposed to 450. So it's a real savings uh, for, for families. So what we hope to do here is increase the number of students who are at the 30 semester hour mark by the time they graduate from high school. And it's amazing how many students actually achieve that or have been for years. Uh, many of you in here may have had kids or you yourselves may have taken CAP courses uh, you know, when you were in high school. And it really gives uh, people a leg up. Since we are the only nationally accredited dual enrollment program in the state, those courses can easily transfer to any university in the country, which really makes them quite portable. So we're very, very proud of that. So um, uh, what I'd like to talk about next, it would be the, what's on everybody's mind, and that is the, uh, the restructuring of the UW system, the UW colleges. Uh, as you know, the Board of Regents voted a few months ago to essentially dissolve the UW colleges and incorporate the campuses, the local campuses, into uh, the, the, their respective four-year universities. There are 13 college campuses across the state, uh, and we will uh, inherit two of them, UW Fox Valley and UW Fond du Lac. Uh, will now become part of UW Oshkosh. We will actually be what we like to refer to as a new university in the sense that we'll be three campuses and one university. We have a, a different philosophy towards this merger than, say, many of the other UWs in that, in, in my mind, we won't have a main campus and satellite campuses. We're going to have three campuses. And, and that really is, uh, spe speaks to the, uh, the power, if you will, and, and, and really the strength of this region. Uh, from Fond du Lac, uh, Oshkosh, and the Fox Cities, uh, this is going to be a way for us to really dig into this region and help generate the kind of talent and educational prosperity we need uh, in this region. Uh, one of the things I learned early on when I first got here is that uh, there are three distinct regions of the lake. Uh, that there is Fond du Lac, which doesn't really care much for Oshkosh, which doesn't care much for Fox Cities, which doesn't care much for Oshkosh, which doesn't care much for Fond du Lac. <laughs> And what I'd like to say is that the way we're approaching this, we're, we're now talking about the Lake Winnebago region. 
uh, and that our institution will be able to tie these three areas together. Um, and there are other institutions that have done that. But that's what we really want to emphasize is the idea that we want to be one regional university. Very exciting. Uh, a lot of work to be done. Uh, this is uh, unbelievably complicated. Uh, when you dissolve one university or a series of colleges and, and incorporate in, into others. July 1 is when we will uh, become one university. Uh, and there is a lot of work that's being done. We have over 50 different groups. Uh, we call them work groups that are, that are working to resolve all sorts of different issues and bring things together. You can imagine that the finances of it and the, and the, and the student success uh, considerations and HR and all those kinds of things, all of that has to be consolidated. Every single, this touches every single aspect of university life. And so it's a huge project which uh, we've really rolled up our sleeves and, 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 and gotten into. So uh, stay tuned for that. That's really going to be, uh, I think, a very powerful coupling for this region. And of all the pairings across the state, I think ours is the strongest for a number of reasons. First of all, we're inheriting two very strong campuses in UW Fond du Lac and, and UW Fox, uh, Fox Valley. Second, uh, it's the shortest distance between the three campuses of any of the pairings. Uh, and that, that's really going to matter because uh, the, in terms of our ability uh, over time to roll uh, baccalaureate programs, master's programs onto these campuses in Fox Valley, in, uh, up in the Fox Cities, and Fond du Lac is going to be huge in terms of increasing the educational attainment rate of, of, the, of the region. Third, we will absolutely can maintain our commitment to the access mission of those two campuses, that uh, this is a great place for people who, uh, for all sorts of different reasons, sometimes they're academic reasons, oftentimes they're financial reasons, really would prefer to start at one of the colleges and then transfer to a UW four-year institution. Uh, so we're, gonna, we're no longer going to call that transfer, it'll be transition. That those, they can start on one campus, and then conceivably they could actually finish their baccalaureate degree on those campuses, uh, depending on if we, we have that appropriate degree on the campus. So it'll be very, very powerful. So stay tuned for that. Um, in terms of economic development, uh, this is one of the things that um, um, I wanted to emphasize coming in as, as, as a chancellor is that we have this amazing uh, public institution in Sconston in, in an, an incredible region. Uh, 1.2 million people all the way from Fond du Lac up to Green Bay uh, with unparalleled manufacturing, healthcare, banking, insurance, you name it, uh, we have it in this region. And, um, so I really want to be a part of that. And what could we do to help drive economic prosperity in the area? I believe that diversity is one of those things. Um, um, I like to uh, quote Tracy Robertson a lot, uh, who says that the, that the economic prosperity of this region could ultimately be limited by the lack of diversity, that we need to do something about that in order to bring, bring it about. So we want to be a part of that. We also want to be a part of talent development. And as a part of the Oshkosh Community Success Coalition, which is led by Bill Wyman in the back uh, through the Community Foundation, uh, we, we want to do just that. We want to make, make it part of, of our orientation for students that they get their degrees from UW Oshkosh and they stay in this community after they graduate. So we want to generate and supply the talent that's necessary for this, this region to grow. Uh, finally, I have new leadership at the institution. I just wanted to, to let you know that. We have um, uh, Jim Fletcher is our new CFO, uh, Vice Chancellor for Administrative Services. Uh, Cheryl Green is our new Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs. And John Coker is serving as our interim uh, Provost and Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs. John, of course, has been at the institution for 27 years in, in a number of, as a professor, and he's most recently the Dean of the College of Letters and Science. Uh, I couldn't be more thrilled with the leadership team uh, that, that's in place right now. Uh, they, uh, uh, they work very well together, uh, very, very, very progressive, uh, and I think the future is very bright. So with that, I will end my time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. Our, our last presenter is uh, Mark Harris. He's the executive of Winnebago County. and. Uh, our present presenters are um, 
put on the, on the docket alphabetically by the institution that they are serving, which is why Winnebago is way at the end. It's no reflection on Winnebago County at all, Mark. Uh, here is our county executive, Mark Harris. I've, I've got some bullet points up on the slide and I'll get to those in just a minute, but listening to the presentation of the others, you know, it struck me how intertwined we are. Um, there's an education program the school district has in a county owned building for second chance. Uh, UW Fox Valley is actually owned by Winnebago and Outagamie counties. We own all the buildings and we pay all the capital expenditures. So we're very much part of this partnership of combining those campuses. Um, the city and the, and, and the county uh, share an industrial aviation park uh, that we hope to develop. And uh, so really, and the, and the technical school, I actually served on the technical school board at one time, uh, but sometimes we have joint presentations, we have functions that are together. Uh, they occupy a slot on the county's airport and that's where they run their flight school. So we're all tied together in a lot of complicated ways. And the first item I really want to go into is, is the airport. Um, in partnership with the city, we bought, uh, I believe it was 80 acres of land, and we're trying to develop an aviation industrial park. Um, and we had a lot of partners in that, but uh, we obtained a lot of federal grants that have allowed us to get utilities, and streets and lighting and sewer into that property. The final piece that has to be developed is that the, the, the county has to get a taxiway into that property uh, because what we're trying to do is attract aviation related businesses, especially those that would benefit from being on a major airport. And uh, we did get approval for uh, the funding of the engineering portion of that from the uh, Bureau of Aeronautics. However, they typically pay a lot towards runway and taxiway projects, and they've indicated that they'll participate at some level, but they're requiring us to have a tenant that needs access to the runway before they'll pay any part of the cost of the taxiway. Well, that's a real chicken and the egg. Can I land a tenant that needs to have a taxiway before I have the taxiway? So one of the major things we're gonna have to do, the, the board's gonna be asked to support us putting in a partial taxiway that would give us at least two developable lots on a taxiway. Once we land that first tenant, we'll then press the Bureau of Aeronautics to reimburse us for a portion of that and then to extend that taxiway through the rest of the airport side of the park. So it's complicated. It's gonna be a real long-term development, but I believe that we will get a very significant number of higher paid jobs once that project starts to fill in. And like all the industrial parks, they take a long time to get started, but you're glad you do them over time. Um, the newspaper's uh, coverage of the airport has focused mostly on wildlife. Um, we are working on <laughs> non-lethal means of removing wildlife. I think people don't realize, though, how much of a threat to aviation the wildlife can be. Um, we did have thousands of dollars of damage done to a jet that sucked in a, a snowy owl a few years ago. The same week that we had the incident with the snowy owl, which I know you all know about, and which we're using non-lethal means now, but uh, a, a plane struck a snowy owl at Milwaukee's airport. And, and what's happening is uh, the owls have exhausted their food supply up in the tundra. And they go through a cycle of boom and bust. And when they exhaust the food supply, they travel to find new locations, new sources of food. And to them, the ideal replacement for the tundra is a large, flat, treeless plane <laughs> that we call airports. And by the time they, they arrive here, they're not in good health, and uh, they are not easily scared away by humans. They have no concept of humans. They don't understand cars, they don't understand airports, airplanes, and if they see a rodent or bird crossing a runway while a plane is landing, 
they will go after the rodent or bird. And that's why they, there's so many collisions with the snowy owls. But we are trapping them <laughs> and removing them. It is a much better, much better situation. Um, one of the things the county's focused on in recent years is trying to bring all the uh, services from the county that were in outside buildings into county-owned properties. And that does save us quite a bit of money on rent. Uh, and owning a building is preferable to renting a building for us because of the different treatment we get from the state on operational or capital budgets. Um, but we've done a lot of that. We moved the DA's office from the Beach Building into Orrin King. Uh, we moved some human service functions that were in the AT&T Building into the Human Service Building. Um, we're in the process of moving uh, the Sixth uh, Circuit Court and the, uh, uh, the Family Court from the uh, public safety building into the county courthouse. But it's a lot of work to get all of those things done. We are now fully, uh, we now have all the departments moved into the, uh, the county administrative building, it used to be Oshkosh Bagash. Um, and so that part of the project is complete and the next step is to complete the courthouse project. And that's in addition to, to doing the security. Um, the county has been very efficient in our operations. Our equalized tax rate is the lowest it's been since 2001. That sounds better than it really is. Your properties appreciate in value and an equalized tax rate is the tax rate you get if you sp spread that over the market value of all the properties. So we're allowed to increase our uh, operating taxes by the amount of new construction. But to the extent that the property appreciates that really results in a reduction of the uh, tax rate. So that has been coming down. I think most of you will notice that your county tax bills, not, not everyone's, but in general, they've been relatively flat or very small increases. Um, and, and it's tough to maintain that efficiency because there, there are revenue concerns. Um, when I first was elected county executive, the bulk of the cash flow for the county for our operations was either state money or federal money that passed through the state's hands and came to us. Um, that's down about $20 million from where it was in 2005 for very complicated reasons. Some services have been moved too, but we always have to find a way to deal with declining uh, support from the state, which typically shifts costs onto the levy. So we always have to be thinking of ways to save money, to become more efficient. And, and I think we've largely succeeded on that. And uh, I believe that's about the end of my time. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Mark. And I want to thank our audience. You really came through with questions um, because I was all set to either ask Stan to keep go back to his slide, um, or ask uh, Mark Roloff to talk about deer culling um, in light of the snowy owl situation. Um, but instead, we'll go straight to your questions. Um, and I'm going to start with you. Um, Stan, someone asks, what is the achievement gap in the Oshkosh Area School District? The, um, the details I don't have with me that I can share with you, but um, next week at um, Oshkosh for Education, that's uh, part of that. It continues to be um, a, um, a gap, particularly with um, um, minority as well as um, uh, students in poverty. Um, it continues to be there, but we are closing the gap and we're making forward progress in, in all areas. Our toughest area is in literacy. Um, we um, do outstanding in math, uh, but uh, literacy, remember, is, um, it includes um, what um, those of us who have this color hair remember as reading, uh, writing, spelling, um, and English or language arts, depending upon the era you were in, and um, all combined in that area. And that um, is also indicative of, of the issue of life experiences that um, children who have um, um, come from homes where um, 
um, uh, the high level of poverty or um, that uh, there isn't the amount of language that middle and upper class uh, children are experienced with. But uh, closing the gap, we are. But the details I did not um, bring this evening, but um, we'll uh, be presenting that in detail with a report uh, that, um, in fact, I just um, read today, once again, uh, the draft of the formal print report that will be also available if you cannot attend. But uh, simply contact the school district offices and we will provide you with a, a comprehensive report that's part of the Oshkosh for Education uh, presentation that will be done next week. Thank you, Stan. I've been uh, reading the questions, and so far no one has a question for Melissa from uh, about the vote tax. So if one of you wants to show her some love, I'm sure she'd be willing to answer any question you ask. Um, but two people, Mark Roloff, has af have asked about the status of the plans for the Pioneer. Well, I'm a little bit in trouble on this one because if you attended State of the City last year, my optimism was probably based on a lot of what was going on with the arena. Uh, did I tell you about the arena, that we have a new arena in town? <laughs> um, it's still a work in progress. Um, I, wish, I, I wish I could tell you there has been more progress, but we're probably in about the same spot we were about a year ago. Um, shortly after State of the City, which was in late March, it was probably April or May, um, we traveled down to uh, Madison to meet with the DNR. Uh, local developer has an option on the property. It's still owned by the same person who purchased it in 2003. Uh, for those of you who've been here that long, there was a great deal of conflict between the DNR and that developer. They ultimately settled on, had a settlement on what they could do and not do out there. And those issues are, are still there, they're still required. Um, but time has, has changed perspective, um, and the DNR was actually very open and cooperative with working with uh, the local developer on what could possibly be done. But it's gonna take a lot of money to still do what our, um, uh, finishing the trail that we, you know, the river walk that would ultimately uh, end at the, uh, at the Pioneer and then continue to the south along Pioneer Drive. And the developer is gonna need some assistance and that usually says TIF, um, but if the TIF money has to be used for the Riverwalk, it can't be used for the hotel. So that's kind of the dilemma that, that that person's in right now. That person's also busy with other projects in other locations and that's probably as much a diversion, which I can't control. Um, we're certainly happy to work with them, but that's a, still a work in progress. Um, but did I mention the arena? Um, but you know, so I think you're gonna keep hearing about that. I, I mentioned it briefly in my presentation, and I think it's just something that it's gonna, the, the stars are gonna have to be in the right alignment, and with these other successful projects we've had, that's what it's taken. So we're, we're continuously uh, talking with them and seeing where, where else we can step in. But right now, they have to make some decisions in terms of uh, where their finances are gonna go. So I spent two minutes on that Kathy stop sign anytime you want. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I'm done with that question. I, I hope I answered it, and if not, I can, I can chat with you afterwards. Um, our next questions are for the chancellor. Uh, first, we're, you're asked uh, whether you will be the chancellor of the three campuses when they're merged. And also, um, the questioner asks, uh, I've al I always hear that Marion College is so innovative and adaptive to their students. Um, is UWO, um, oh, and I can't read this. So um, I'm gonna ask, can UWO be as innovative as Marion is? That's how I'm gonna phrase this question. Uh, the answer to the first question is I hope so. Uh, <laughs> In terms of being the, the chancellor of the, of the campus, the, the chancellors that reside in the four-year uh, campuses will be the chancellors of, of the uh, consolidated institutions. Uh, so uh, yeah, that will happen. Martin Rudd, and some of you may know him, uh, he's the regional dean of the Northeast region, which includes Manitowoc, wonderful guy. Uh, he's actually already joined uh, uh, the senior leadership of this institution informally. Uh, we wanna have him in in all the meetings uh, and he also serves as the representative of our particular joining at the Board of Regents. And I was really pleased with that because every single other joining 
had some soulless vice chancellor from that from the four-year campuses to serving as a representative and we chose to put the regional dean from the two-year campuses on that board representing us and so that, i think that speaks volumes about uh, the attitude that we have going into this american university is a wonderful place um, and i'm getting to know their president uh, and uh, we will be neighbors um, if you are it, 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 the uw fond du lac was a part of a consortium of institutions in fond du lac uh, that worked together uh, to solve uh, common issues that they had. Ripon College is one of those as well uh, that's involved in that. So I certainly want to continue that uh, tradition. There's a lot we can learn uh, from uh, four-year institutions, from two-year institutions, from the tech colleges, uh, all those different things uh, in order to become more nimble uh, and, uh, and versatile. So absolutely, we're open to that. Thank you. Here's, here's a question that I think um, I'm going to ask all our panelists to address. Um, actually, two questions. Um, first is, can you tell us how your institution is addressing anti-sexual harassment training and has this changed in the past year? So one is um, how you're addressing sexual harassment. Uh, the second is how you're addressing um, the need to increase diversity. And I think we'll just start with Stan and go down the, down the table there. In the, in the public school institution that um, uh, we have uh, a number of policies in effect and um, uh, frankly we were reflecting as all of the um, uh, of the movement that occurred this fall that nationally that um, regarding adult to adult inappropriateness we were reflecting on the fact that um, um, in my six years here we have not had any adult to adult inappropriate um, issues of uh, how people relate either supervisors, supervisee, uh, colleagues. Um, we have, however, dealt with um, uh, some adult uh, issues with, uh, with students um, and, uh, uh, and we've uh, dealt with that, those issues um, and uh, there would be a couple of those that have occurred in uh, the past six years. What we keep busy, most busy at is um, um, adolescence. Um, inappropriateness um, with each other, and uh, that's um, undertaken by um, um, uh, everything from um, uh, mild issues to um, issues that are so severe that um, can result in expulsion. And uh, we handle those in uh, the appropriate manner based on the intensity of, um, of what has occurred. We have a significant uh, training issue that um, we provide um, uh, uh, across the district, uh, it's called um, safe training, uh, of which we deal with uh, lots of the issues with uh, a team of um, uh, both our social workers and psych uh, social workers and counselors who deal with um, training um, for um, all adults and also for all children across the district um, on the appropriateness of relationship and genders. And um, I think that's meeting um, a good deal of the need, but. Uh, uh, but the reality is that um, adolescence and uh, that uh, uh, frontal lobe developing um, is not always um, uh, one that um, occurs at the speed that we would like to see it develop and we handle those, those issues. But um, uh, in my past days in working in human resources um, regarding um, employees of, of districts, um, I, um, I basically uh, did presentations over time and I talked about uh, the reality that um, inappropriate conduct is professional suicide. It is not just losing a job, it is the issue of losing a license to practice. And that's very clear, very, um, very um, uh, standard in expectation of how appropriate behavior for adults are. Diversity? Oh, oh okay. Is that half of that? Yeah. And so you get to talk more, Stan. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> how are you addressing the increasing diversity of we are um, continuing um, uh, with um, extensive training, um, including uh, reliance on um, uh, a, a couple of university professors who have provided um, in-service training to both um, our, our staff and administrative staff, and we're continuing that effort with um, additional training for um, all of our staff. But we also have um, um, African American students uh, participate in the coalition with uh, the Fox Valley uh, students on, uh, on exposing them to um, uh, African American cultural um, experiences that um, uh, assist in having those students um, uh, participate with their fellow students from across uh, Fox Valley um, in, in these activities, plus uh, the support of um, uh, 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 
cultural groups um, that are um, available in, in especially in our high schools but providing those experiences and in uh, two weeks now or a week from Monday um, uh, uh, Martin Luther King uh, Day we also have um, events and activities occurring in many of our secondary schools as well as observances and discussions in our elementary schools regarding uh, the african-american needs um, our largest um, uh, minority populations um, are, um, are not African-American students, um, would be uh, Hispanic um, uh, is, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and Hmong uh, and student population. And um, uh, in each of those, we um, support and encourage their cultural activities as clubs and activities within our schools. Uh, regarding uh, sexual harassment training, uh, the, um, I was very fortunate to have inherited a, a, a very good policy that has been in place predating me, and uh, it's pretty much withstood the test of time. Uh, I'd like to say we've had no reports of that, but those happen periodically, and we investigate them in accordance with our policies, and when there's an issue, we, we address it, and we have in the past. Uh, those aren't things you necessarily want to wave the banner about, but uh, our policies are pretty well known. First day uh, for any new employee, that is one of the topics that's uh, discussed, and we pretty much make that very clear that that's uh, unacceptable behavior and what the uh, consequences of that behavior will be. So I'm very proud of that. Uh, with diversity, uh, that is uh, a work in progress. It is amazing what two years can do. Uh, when the council uh, last met in their uh, retreat to discuss their strategic plan, it was referenced briefly, uh, but uh, not necessarily put into the plan as far as a higher level goal, but it was listed in there as an issue that we needed to be have on our radar screen. And in two years, it has literally exploded in terms of a discussion point. Uh, the council in 2016 had asked me to take a look at the possible creation of diversity coordinator position. Although the council ultimately decided not to do it, uh, and there was a lot of backlash, and you, you need to know that. There were, this is not a universal um, agreement on that, and that's just one of the things we deal with in Oshkosh is uh, we like to argue about things, and that was one of the things that was there. Um, and I love to joke a lot, but this wasn't a laughing matter. Um, and that was something that we knew we needed to do something about, <clears throat> even though there was a great deal of public uh, divisiveness on this issue. Um, but we know that it's an issue. Um, and I, I'm going to, th you know, we've had a lot of discussion about Oshkosh Corporation. Um, I am very pleased with the work that they've done and the discussions they've had with me. They know, and it, it really follows what Chancellor Levitt had said, our success is going to be largely based on talent attraction. And if we forego 40% of our population in this country, we are going to limit ourselves in our success. So there is a... From a pure number standpoint, we need to make sure that we are trying to attract the best and the brightest and do recruitment to do that. Um, council has done a couple things, even though we have not uh, created a diversity coordinator position. Uh, number one, uh, they added a position uh, in human resources uh, that is largely devoted to recruitment and training. It's recruiting people, attracting people to our organization. Uh, and the second one is towards that end, uh, the police department is really leading by example. And they've created uh, what the chief has called a cadet program. And what this does is essentially allows him to identify people with great potential uh, that uh, through a program through the state, we will provide all the training and, and reimburse that person for all the training associated with going to uh, the technical college to go through uh, the uh, public safety certification program. It's sort of what we used to call police recruit school. That's what the technical college provides. Um, and we will pay that person to go to school and the tuition will get paid by the state and upon completion uh, we'll have somebody uh, join our workforce. And uh, we 
while it's not stated that it's intended for diversity, our first uh, participant was African American. We're very pleased at the progress he's making. He's going to be joining us. He's not even a, an official employee yet. Uh, although he's on the payroll, he's not on the street. He's going through the technical college, and in May he'll be a. Uh, He'll be on the street uh, going through field training with our police department. And I think those are the types of examples uh, we need to follow because we need to give um, potential applicants a chance at success. And this is part of that cadet program. And appreciate the support that the council's given. Uh, it didn't really cost us any money except putting that money out there uh, to get them, to basically pay them to go to school. But the results that we're going to get is going to be a much more diverse workforce and Stan hadn't even thrown out the statistic about the, the number of um, minority students we have in our school system is much greater than the overall proportion of our population. But those are the people that we, th those are the, the people in our community that our police officers are, are talking to on a daily basis. We need to plan for the future by having our workforce reflect that. We have a long way to go, and I won't deny that. Um, but I think we're making good progress, and I suspect that when we do our next strategic planning process, I, I very much expect that to, to rise to the top as a priority. It's part of our community success coalition that we've been working on, and uh, Chancellor Levitt and I had a debate one day, is diversity a means to an end or an end to itself? And it's probably a little bit of both, but right now it's got to be a means to an end, and a means to an end meaning a more diverse workforce, talent attraction, because Folks like me are going to be retiring, and I ask you, um, who's buying your house? That one question tells you, you need to have somebody there that's going to buy your house. They got to make a good wage to afford the house you own because you plan to downsize and go to some condo somewhere else, hopefully along the river in downtown Oshkosh. <laughs> but before you do that, you got to get somebody to buy your house. And that, think about that when you're trying to come up with an argument. And uh, I, was, I was taught that uh, about 30 years ago by an Hispanic um, HR director in California. And that's what he, he told people, who's buying your house? And when you think about that, that's why we need diversity. If you need a self, you know, selfish reason to do it, that, that's the next buyer of your house. So think about that as you think about the value of diversity and talent attraction for our community. I'll leave you with that little thought. As far as the sexual harassment training, um, Stan kind of mentioned it. As a big institution, we have major policies uh, related to sexual harassment, and we do um, extensive training throughout the year with most staff. So uh, we address those issues. To date, I'm not aware of any type of uh, incidents that we've had. So we, again, it's, it's, it's uh, referenced through our HR department. Um, the diversity question, I, I guess I can look at it in two different ways. Um, we have a large, diverse population of students because we host the ELL, ESL programs here at Fox Valley Tech. So again, um, individuals that are learning the English language, in, any individual that is receiving any type of assistance um, that does not speak English must come here, mandatory to Fox Valley Tech to uh, start initiating learning the English language. So we do see a lot of a diverse, uh, a diverse population. We have, throughout the college, 50 languages uh, being spoken. We have um, a global um, uh, ed department. We go out and we visit different countries. We are always looking for diverse students to come to Fox Valley Technical College. We have a huge contention in Appleton from South America, uh, the natural resources uh, program and the like, the water treatment. Um, so we do have a diverse student body. Um, again, as far as staffing, um, a, a work in progress, and I'll use that same language, we do have and developed a diversity and inclusion department. Um, we have staff that come down here each day, and they represent uh, the languages that are most often spoken in the area, which is the Hmong, 
excuse me, Hispanic, and then of course we have African American um, counselors. Those folks are on campus every day. We also have a contention of approximately, well at one time it was up to 90 students living at Grunhagen. Um, again, as things, as these enrollments are in this decline mode, that's up to about 50, 60. We do have staff that meet with those residents as well. Um, so it's a combination of both seeing um, uh, diverse students and providing diversity services. Um, those diverse, di diversity counselors are here specifically to help those students with um, attaining their degrees and working with them on all kinds of different situations. So. So we have uh, 1,700 employees and about 11,000 students on a 76-acre <laughs> campus. I can assure you there are all sorts of interactions. Most of them are very positive, some of them not so positive. Uh, we have instituted this uh, sexual harassment or workplace harassment training uh, in the last two years. Uh, we also have uh, new consensual relationship policies at the system uh, level, uh, which is, uh, in my opinion, has put a stop to a lot of uh, uh, incidences that may have happened in the past between faculty and students. If you recall, the vast majority of our students, of course, are people of age, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's a power differential which is completely inappropriate. Uh, and so uh, that's something we take a very hard line on and make sure that everybody is uh, within the lane they need, to, they need to be in on that issue. Um, are we doing enough? Actually, I'm, I'm quite surprised that the, the Me Too movement has not crested on higher education yet. And it will uh, at some point. It's, it's, it's making its rounds to various different institutions within our society. And I have every confidence that it will, it will definitely break on higher education in the future. Uh, I hope it doesn't break too hard here. That's all I'm saying is that, like I say, with the number of people that we have, uh, we have a very aggressive uh, Title IX program on our campus that ensures that everyone on our campus uh, can have uh, equal access to employment and an education in an environment which is uh, free of, of, of uh, gender-related uh, sexual harassment. Uh, so that's, that's something that's very important to us. On the diversity front, I gave you some good news at the beginning, but of course we also have some uh, challenges as well. Uh, we do a, quite a bit of training and when it comes to unconscious bias, uh, which is a problem uh, on, our, on our campus and, and most campus, all, all campuses really, any, anywhere you have large concentrations of people. Uh, so making people aware of what their unconscious biases is, is certainly a step. It's, it's a little bit like the movie Groundhog Day, that every single year we get a fresh group of freshmen on our campus who come from all different parts of Wisconsin, primarily maybe some Illinois folks, but at the same time they're coming together and, and for many students they're experiencing diversity for the very first time. Uh, and uh, it's about training. It's about uh, uh, making sure that we can imprint upon the students what the expectations are for uh, uh, civil discourse, uh, civility on our campus, uh, making sure that everybody's treated uh, with respect um, and equity. Uh, so it's something that we work on all the time. It was, uh, I can assure you there are problems <laughs> whenever you have this many people together, but it's something that we uh, very much focus on and we mitigate these issues every single day. Thank you. Like the other institutions, you have to be vigilant about sexual discrimination and other discrimination. And uh, I believe the county tries to do that. Occasionally, someone is sent for remedial training where, where there's been a complaint about insensitivity. Uh, but we did do something kind of unique uh, this morning. In the Personnel and Finance Committee, we added transgender and gender identity as, as classes that should get the same type of project, uh, protections that nobody, everyone has to be dealt with respect and nobody should be discriminated against because of who they are. And I was really proud because I think that's a really progressive step. Thank you, panelists. Uh, I've got three fairly quick questions, I think, for you, Stan. Um, first, um, 
Oh, I'm talking to Stan. Yeah, we'll see. Okay. Um, first, uh, what steps can be taken to reverse the amount of money we lose from vouchers? Um, how are we doing with retiring staff and principals? And finally, um, do you anticipate any cuts in programs in the next school year? Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll try to tackle those one. From, from the standpoint of um, uh, let, uh, steps that can be taken for the amount on vouchers, um, uh, the reality is in Wisconsin, I think it's, um, it's institutionalized. I think um, uh, the likelihood of there being a reverse on, um, on vouchers is um, uh, fairly slight. The issue is that it has an escalator in and putting a uh, hold on so that the growth does not continue or that the income level of the qualifying parents would be frozen at a level that um, would um, hold it steady and not continue to increase costs. Um, wholesale elimination, I think uh, that uh, is uh, highly unlikely uh, unless there is massive changes in the, the assembly and the Senate as well as in the governor's office. But um, freezing the ever increasing escalation. Remember that between last year and this year, it virtually doubled in the, on, uh, the contribution in the cost to taxpayers. We went from about 400,000 to over 800,000 in um, uh, uh, the cost of the vouchers for this school district alone. And um, that's because uh, of the qualifying threshold um, escalated up and an increase in the percentage of students that could qualify under the existing state formula. So uh, I'm not um, really um, uh, uh, optimistic about that kind of change. Regarding the, um, uh, the issue on retirement, um, um, uh, of administ we've been really fortunately blessed. Um, we've had stability um, in uh, that we're going into, we're in our fourth year now of um, having uh, stability with the principal with only one retirement um, in uh, the last um, uh, four years and only losing one principal through retirement uh, to, and no principals to other school districts. Um, now, um, how long that will continue um, is uh, unpredictable, but we've had stability um, uh, along the way. Um, but, um, you know, the days of, um, as I always put it, uh, the days of uh, thank goodness of involuntary servitude uh, are long gone. And the reality is that new opportunities always come along. And because we train both our principals well and because we train our teachers well, we become attractive targets to other districts that might pay them more. And that's really the biggest uh, uh, loss possibility because um, uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, there is virtually none of our principals and our highest, and um, what we also notice is um, our highest quality teachers we lose because they're well trained and well prepared. The biggest stability for us in, um, in holding on to our teachers is holding on to our principals. When our principals leave, they know the best ones, and they steal them to those districts where they go to. And that, um, uh, so um, the the uh, major aid in in um, holding on to highly qualified teachers is to hold on to our good principals, and that's um, where we're at um, right now. Um, we're. Um, uh, with the exception of myself, um, I don't think there's really quite anyone in the, in the retirement age right now. <laughs> we've, got a, we've got a respite there. But the danger of losing individuals to um, uh, promotional opportunities in other districts always exists, and I fully respect that because uh, all of you who have worked in different jobs and different opportunities, no one stood in your way if you thought it was best for you to move on. And, um, um, but um, we always hope that we can keep our, our good principles working in the district, but uh, age-wise, we're fortunate right now. Was there a third question? Any, any program cuts in the coming years? Um, the, we're taking a hard look because, um, uh, frankly, um, the additional um, $2 million that um, is coming from the $200 um, per student growth um, will uh, not keep up with um, real inflation that we face. We've worked very hard to um, help our, um, to stabilize our workforce by um, uh, following up on uh, CPI index authorized by the state for um, increases in compensation for our employees. But if we do that, um, we, we will face a deficit for the uh, coming year. 
but um, we're uh, simply taking a hard look as we did with um, elementary this past year. We made some major adjustments by uh, uh, upping the um, average class size in elementary um, uh, to the um, still being within the um, board's adopted uh, ratios. And um, we ended up being able to um, uh, effectively uh, have uh, six less elementary teacher positions without having um, um, to uh, cut any uh, programs and to have students. In fact, we were able to uh, comprehensively um, uh, uh, reschedule so that we could have um, art, um, art, uh, FIED, and, and music uh, teachers move less and be more s stable across the district. Um, we're looking at those same issues at the, uh, s at the secondary level with middle school and high school uh, principals. Um, there is not a lot of creative creativity we have with um, middle school schedules because uh, the last thing we want is you don't put middle schoolers into study halls. Um, that's not a good idea. <laughs> and um, uh, uh, trying to avoid that but uh, at the high school level we have to take a good hard look at making sure that um, we have minimum class sizes um, our two high school principals and uh, have worked very very hard on um, um, never saying no um, even when sometimes enrollment can't uh, the total enrollment in a particular class doesn't uh, justify um, uh, offering that section and more and more we're going to have to take a look at that and that's what we're studying right now so we're trying to keep a reduction in force um, be as low um, uh, non-visible as possible but every student may not get exactly the class uh, classes that they want because there aren't enough um, uh, as, uh, students enrolled one of the tragedies for a first language German speaker um, is uh, as a German uh, a speaker this past year we eliminated um, we eliminated uh, German as being an offering in the district, there simply was not enough enrollment between the two high schools to keep a, a German teaching position in, in effect. That's a classic example of how we have to pair back. We did that without being um, uh, um, in a position to um, um, have major budget cuts, but we have to carefully look at not offering classes in some cases of 10 or 12 students in, in a section. You simply can't afford to do that. So we're trying to keep it as uh, low as possible without massive uh, budget cuts for this coming year. All right, uh, I, we're gonna make it two because these are related uh, for Mr. Roloff. Um, first, is Lake Clubhouse closed for good? Any spring golf at all? So that's one. And the related one is, are there, does the city have ideas for uh, what could be the use of Oshkosh Corp's current buildings when they vacate them? Okay, why don't you hand me those questions so I can uh, use them as a see, cheat sheet. This one and this one. All right. Uh, Lakeshore Clubhouse, uh, the answer is yeah, that's gonna be closed for good. That is essentially at the heart of where Oshkosh Corporation will be putting their building. So uh, if we continue to have Lakeshore uh, or any type of golf course there on site, we'll have to look at a clubhouse, a new clubhouse. So that obviously is gonna be a, a cost consideration. Um, as spring golf, no, there'll be no plans for spring golf because uh, we're gonna be doing a couple things. Uh, number one, we're gonna be uh, starting construction with Oshkosh Corporation, they plan to, to break ground in spring, and we also need to begin work on the public infrastructure. Uh, that doesn't mean necessarily that the rest of the assets of Lakeshore are going away, uh, even though I don't think we're gonna be able to uh, uh, provide golf this summer, this spring. Uh, we're gonna, if we decide to keep it, we gotta still maintain it as a golf course. You just don't let it grow out, and the, the, that's what the golf pros are telling me. So uh, we'll have to make a decision soon so that we, if we're, if we're not going to have a golf course, that's one way. But if we keep a golf course, that goes a completely different way. Um, Oshkosh Corporation, they are leasing a lot of properties throughout the city. I suspect that a lot of those properties will get turned back to their landlords and, uh, and, and be used for other purposes. Now, with that said, you drive around town, you see a lot of Oshkosh Corp logos going all over the place. Uh, some are in a car dealership. 
that's where car dealerships belong. So, and that's a long commercial corridor. So, uh, frankly, I think that that's a good thing that they're out of those locations. Um, to the degree they have their own sites, I suspect that with the growth of their defense industry, that they're going to backfill some of those spots that they own with um, with defense personnel, uh, because that's where their their major growth is going to be. They anticipate doing some. Uh, some corporate growth, but they also have some defense growth that, that is clearly going to be their big upside over the, over the near, uh, the immediate future. So I hope I answered those questions properly. I want to thank those of you who are in our audience here. We have about 50 people hearing about uh, what's planned uh, for our community in the coming year, and I'm confident that next January we'll be we'll here again for the seventh uh, Oshkosh Outlook for 2018. Uh, thanks for coming and drive safely.